Uh, we have been doing our uh, s- uh, series here on Sunday nights about uh, walking in the Spirit, talking about the fruit of the Spirit. We went through love uh, for um, uh, quite a bit, and uh, it's kind of a shame that it didn't continue on to today. Today seems to be the day for that. Uh, but um, the next thing on our list there, the fruit of the Spirit is love, and then, anybody know? Joy. Joy is the next thing. That's just kind of the natural next progression after love. And I covered a little bit of this on Wednesday night. The Lord led me to uh, read there um, in Habakkuk and uh, read about uh, the joy there in, in following the Lord and in, and in um, uh, putting our, our trust in Him and our hope in Him and our expectations in Him. And so tonight, I wanna, I'm want to i going to present to you the message I was going to preach Wednesday night. I'm kind of combining our Sunday night and Wednesday night uh, series this evening And I want to give you a a message here. So uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse number 22 is our text here for our series on Sunday nights. Galatians 5, 22 says, but the fruit of the Spirit is. Now we're breaking it down and looking at each of these individually. uh, But I don't think I've mentioned this yet in the series. Note it's the fruit of the Spirit, not the fruits of the Spirit. And so we're looking at individual things in our life that ought to be evidence of the Holy Spirit Uh, guiding us and us walking in the Spirit. But really, all of this combined should be the fruit of us walking in the Spirit. But tonight, we continue on. We've looked at love. The fruit of the Spirit is love. And then secondly, joy. And so tonight, I want to bring a message to you entitled, The Joy of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful tonight to be in your house. And Lord, among your people, we're thankful for your word. And uh, Lord, just uh, all that you've Uh, been able to do in our lives to bring us to this point, Lord, the good and the bad, and uh, Lord, the ups and the downs, we are are grateful for, we are thankful for, because you've been there through them all. Lord, I ask that you'd speak to our hearts tonight, and Lord, we thank you for the good morning we had, pray you'd continue to meet with us tonight, Lord, that we might get a glimpse of you, and just, uh, Lord, the sweet songs we've been able to sing and to hear uh, today, talking about your love for us, Lord, may we uh, be compelled to love you a little bit dearer this week, and Lord, that we might just uh, continually grow closer to you. And Lord, as we consider joy tonight, may we get that from you. May that uh, be sparked in us, the joy of the Lord. Pray you'd bless uh, each and everything that goes on tonight. Be with those that can't be among us today. And Lord, that you would give us a special blessing uh, through it all. I pray you'd uh, just go with us as we leave here tonight, Lord, just as we go into our week. Pray you'd just, just give us, Lord, handfuls of purpose, as you always do. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The joy of the Lord. We talked a little bit on uh, Wednesday night about joy, and joy is something that we tend to focus on uh, at different times more than others. Christmas time is often a time of joy, and I noticed something interesting. I I like to do word searches in the Bible. Um, I like to see where words appear, and sometimes that speaks to me. And I'm going to talk about this probably next Sunday night, uh, if the Lord allows. But as I, I looked at where that word shows up, At first, my expectations were met. I thought joy has to be found the most times in the book of Psalms. To me, that makes sense. Uh, Talking about the Lord and what he's done for us, it's more devotional, it's more poetic there. And uh, it just, it would make sense to me that that is where we would hear about joy the most. And and sure enough, that that was the case. Um, I don't have it in these notes because it's another message. So if I get this wrong, forgive me, I'll correct it next week. I believe... The second most place that we find it, at least in the New Testament, is the book of Luke. And I found that to be interesting. Luke tells us the most about the birth of Jesus. And Luke's gospel includes the most joy. We think about that at Christmas time. Often we see it in the decorations, you know, good tidings of great joy. When Elizabeth hears uh, that, uh, that Mary has come, she says, the babe leapt in my womb for joy. There's all kinds of joy in the book of Luke. And then uh, Jesus even refers to it more in the book of Luke. I, I found that to be interesting, just specifically. Uh, there's one other place in the Old Testament very unlikely place that I thought I would find a lot of joy, and that's what we're going to look at next Sunday night. But as we consider this, um, again, the series we're going through on Wednesday nights is that phrase, of the Lord. And the phrase, of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, shows up one time in Scripture. And uh, most of the ones that are only showing up once, I'm not going to cover. Um, There's simple little things. Um, You know, uh, I, I can't think of any off the top of my head that I know for sure are just one instance uh, but, you know, should, we, should the Lord have mentioned a button on a shirt and it says the button of the Lord? We're, we're not going to cover the button of the Lord. That just, 
Who knows? Maybe the Lord could get in that. Uh, but I, I almost passed on this because I thought, well, joy is going to be a different subject. Um, but I, I want to point this out to you. I'm just going to read it to you. It takes place in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse number 10. And um, we looked at this verse not that long ago. The Bible says this, Then said he unto them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink the sweet, and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our, our Lord. Neither be ye sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. And uh, I got to pondering that, the joy of the Lord being our strength. Joy is something that we often attribute to the Lord. Um, we say that true joy can't uh, come uh, from anywhere other than the Lord. That's the only place we're going to experience true joy. That's a phrase we use often, true joy. And what that means is that there's happiness. And um, in Sunday school, I think I'll be covering happiness in a couple of weeks here. Happiness is different than joy. Happiness is rooted in our circumstances, our happenstances, as it were. We compare happiness. We say that's a relatively good outlook generated from our good happenstances. We would compare that with joy, which the definition we give to it often is a rejoicing of the soul, regardless of our outward situations. We often say that joy is that happiness no matter what happens. But there's a little bit more to it than that. Joy is not just simply a good outlook or a cheerful disposition. Joy is not simply us acting like things are okay when they're not. Joy is not that uh, hidden secret uh, power that gets us through. Uh, well, how, how do you get through those things? Well, it's just the joy of the Lord. No, there's, there's a little bit more to it than that. Joy is conveyed as an emotion. It's a state of being. And there's different ways that we use the word. It is often linked to gratitude and thanksgiving. Uh, being grateful for things will bring joy into your life. We've, we've heard preaching on that. We see Bible on that. Rejoicing, I mentioned on Wednesday night, is the action of joy. Leda and I were talking about that a little bit. She was uh, telling me about the difference uh, in the words, in, uh, in, uh, in her language and in our language, and how joy and rejoicing in English sound similar, and it makes sense to us. But she says that even back, even into Hebrew, it's, they're different. It's a different word. And uh, sometimes we just assume they go together, but rejoicing is that acting upon joy, is that choosing of joy. And uh, I found that really compelling as I considered the joy of the Lord. I often think of our God as a joyful God, that he's created everything. When he created it, he looked at it all and said it was very good. And he experiences a relationship with us. And uh, I just, I often think of him as being joyful but that is framing God in an emotion that I understand. Yet joy comes from the Lord. Joy is something that he created, that he experiences. And the only way I can get in on that is if the joy of the Lord becomes my joy. In John chapter 15, verse number 11, Jesus said, These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. And we think about that often, the joy of the Lord becoming our joy. What makes God happy, what pleases him, needs to be what makes me happy, what pleases me. The things that bring a smile to his face need to bring a smile to my face. The things that I can rejoice in in him are the things that I need to rejoice in in my life on a regular basis. Joy. And this brings about a concept here. He says that my joy might remain in you. That implies that it can wax and wane. It won't necessarily be all that we should let it be in our lives. But he says in that your joy might be full. Fullness of joy. It's a common theme in scripture. And it is clear where that can be found. As close to God as you can get. Psalm 1611 says, Thou wilt show me the path of life in thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. And that true joy, that real lasting joy, to have our joy full, the Bible says we need to be closer to him. Have you ever seen, you know, uh, thinking of a, I can't think of a, a specific instance, but maybe a toy or some kind of a device the closer it gets to its source, the more it lights up. We see something, maybe a, a detector or something, you know. Um, 
Boy, I should have had an illustration for this. I get, oh, let me give you this. Uh, familiar in, in science with uh, neutrons, electrons, all that within a, within a cell, re you know, revolving there around the nucleus. That's what everything's made up of. Those are atoms, right? And if I have it correct, I haven't looked this up for a while, but in order for an electron, I think it's an electron, to become a photon, which means that it emits light, it has to do one thing. An electron's going round and round and round the nucleus. In order for it to become a photon, in order for it to emit light, it has to move closer to the nucleus. It gets closer to its hub, to its center, to its source, therefore intensifying the power that's there, and then it can light. And that's the way our joy works. The closer we are to God, the more of his joy will just kind of wear off on us. Will just kind of, you ever been around a friend that just, you haven't seen for a long time and I'm sure you can resonate with this. You get home from spending time with them. You say, my face is sore from smiling. My stomach hurts from laughing. I mean, they've had such an effect on you that the joy you experience, it lasts for a while. It stays with you. You've been changed by it. I like to think of the joy of the Lord that way spiritually. And it is something, number one tonight, it is something to think about the joy of the Lord. Um, there are a lot of people in my life I want to make happy. There are a lot of people that I, I don't want them to be at odds with me. And, and as a matter of fact, I, I try to go out of my way when I can to, to bring happiness to them. And to think that we can do that for our God is an interesting thought. He says that my joy might remain in you. The joy of the Lord is something to consider, something to ponder. Look with me. Um, where are we? We're in Galatians. Well, go to Hebrews chapter 12. Let's go there. Hebrews chapter 12. When Jesus told the parable of the householder and the servants that he left his talents with, he gets to the part of that account and he says that the householder comes home, the good men of the house, and he asks each of them what they've done with the things that he's bestowed to them, the things that he's entrusted to them. And they come before him and the one that had five talents said, Lord, here's your five and here's the five that I've earned on top of it. And then the other comes and he says, you know, here's the, what I, the top of my head, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to butcher this here. Whatever his amount is, he's doubled it. And then the last one, of course, he says, here's yours, laid up in a napkin, right? We're familiar with the, with the parable, with the story. But there's something that he says, this householder, a picture of the Lord, and speaking to us of our reward. In Matthew 25, 21, Jesus said, his Lord said unto him, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. And then he says this, enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. I thought about that exchange, about that interaction. Not only did he please the householder, did he please his employer, not only did he do a good job, but now he was in a state of good standing with him. And when I compare that to our relationship with God, we talk about rewards. We talk about God blessing us for, for serving him and for doing things that will last for eternity. But something I think that we don't spend enough time thinking about is just simply one of the best rewards that we can get for serving God is to enter into his joy. To know that my life has put a smile on his face. That my life has brought him happiness. The God of heaven. That he's asked me to do something and I've been able to do it by his grace and through his power. And that when he sees me, he says, come on in and experience the joy of thy Lord. That's the first half of it, making him happy. The second half then is thinking about, he, this is a picture here of us. We're entering into eternity with our rewards, right? The things that we've done that have accumulated for a spiritual uh, investment, as it were. And one of the things we often don't talk about when we talk about heaven is to just be in the presence of the joy of God. We talk about heaven being happy, seeing grandma and grandpa and loved ones and no longer dealing with sin and temptation and our flesh. 
But to be in a place where the joy of God is full. I've had some days where my joy was full. I've had some days where God was so good to me and it could not get any better. But imagine a day where God's joy is full. Where it can't get any better for Him. The Lord's had some rough days. I know He's God and He can handle it. I know that He's not affected by things like we are. Nothing catches Him by surprise. But we see Him grieved at His heart in Scripture. We see His anger uh, being kindled. We see His wrath and His judgment different times. But imagine a day where the joy of God is full. Boy, that's something to consider. In Hebrews chapter 12, uh, chapter 11, he speaks about all those that have gone on before us. We call it the hall of faith. Those that trusted in God, a good example for us to follow. And so he says in verse 1, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. I love that title of our God. He is the author, the originator of our faith and the finisher. He started it. He finished it. There's nothing we need to do except just live by faith. Follow him by faith, as we see in chapter 11. He says, Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Perfect song uh, that the lady sang tonight, bringing this thought home. The joy that was set before him. Excuse me, what joy? <laughs> what joy is there in what he had to accomplish? What joy is there in what he had to endure? It says he despised the shame. I understand that part. I understand the ridicule and, and the things that he went through physically and, and how that must have been hard for even God himself. But for the joy that was set before him, I don't have a verse of scripture to prove it, and I hope the Lord will back me up on this when I see him in eternity. But I believe that joy was his sight of you and I. Walking to that cross, thought about those that were going to be made whole because of this. Thought of those that were going to be made right with God, who were going to be at peace with him and eternity with him. Boy, that would bring some joy to his heart in the midst of those circumstances. The joy of the Lord. That's something to think about. But to take that one step further, we've hinted at it already, that his joy would be fulfilled in us. Go to um, John chapter 3. John chapter 3. That his joy might be fulfilled in us. Paul said... I don't have the verse off top of my head or in my notes, but Paul said to one of his churches that he wrote to, he was giving them instructions about working together and about striving together for the ministry. And it's a verse we know well. Paul said, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. Paul said, you know what would make me the most happy? You know what would just fill out my need for you is if you all were on the same page. And those that read that letter, that knew Paul, surely would have had a burden in their heart to say, boy, Paul wants us to get along. Let's do whatever we can to make that happen, to fulfill Paul's joy. How much more Jesus' joy when he says to us, listen, there's some things that if you do, boy, boy, <laughs> it'll fulfill his joy. John chapter 3, verse number 29, says this. John 3, well, let me get there. And verse 29. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. Jesus is giving an analogy here. He's representing himself as the groom. He's the bridegroom. And the church then is his bride. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. That makes sense, right? When you get married, the guy that gets the bride, he's, he's the groom. That, that's how it works. Uh, hopefully, that, that's the intent. He says, But the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This then my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. I've only been married once, and I've only experienced this once. 
But to have people, and I, I don't want to experience it another time as much as it was lovely, to be able to watch other people's joy at my joy, to have people surrounding me that this is my experience, my wife's experience, this is our day, and yet just them being there and being a part of it brings them joy. You can see it on people's faces, you know, you do the, the receiving line kind of thing, and every person that comes through, I mean, as far as I know, I didn't catch anybody slinking off, you know, upset. <laughs> they're, they're happy, they're excited, their joy is full. Jesus here, he's, he's giving us some, there's some doctrinal things and some, uh, some, some prophetic things that he's talking about here, but the concept is the same that he says, I've got the bride and that makes me happy. My joy is full, but the friend of the bridegroom, he's just, he's just kind of off to the side. He's just part of it. And yet that makes him happy. But he says here, this my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. We as the church fulfill a spot in the heart of our God, in the heart of our Lord, fulfilling it. Joy, like every groom wants his bride, Christ wants his church. Go to uh, chapter 17, John 17. Let me show you something here. John 17, <clears throat> and verse number 13. Uh, let's go back to 12 for the, for the context. He says, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. He's praying here to the Lord, Jesus is. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept. And none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Chew on that for a while. Think about that. His joy being fulfilled in us. The joy of the Lord. Now, I want to finish tonight with a thought. I want to leave this with you. God's joy and our joy, well, let me, let me say it this way. Our joy ought to stem from his joy. True joy, as we said at the onset, comes from the Lord. True joy um, is, uh, is, is wrapped up in our salvation in Christ. And that's where we get it. But to God, joy is a noun. From his perspective... Joy is a thing. It is a state. It is a place, a location even. Much as the word glory is a noun for God. When God speaks of glory, he's talking about a thing that surrounds him. When God speaks of glory, he's talking about a place where we can be in his glory. That's a physical spot, a noun. And there's verses that, that all through Scripture that tell us this. All through the Psalms. Let me give you a list of these here. Uh, Psalm 1611 says, thou, thou wilt show me the path of life. I believe I read this earlier. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Psalm chapter 30, verse number 5. For his anger endureth but a moment. In his favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. That's a noun. That's a thing. That's a state. Psalm 43, verse number 4, Then will I go unto the altar of God, unto God my exceeding joy. Yea, upon the harp will I praise thee, O God, my God. Joy oftentimes paired with singing or praise or worship of God. How to make us happy. How to make us joyful when we worship God. Psalm 48, 2, he says, Beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion. On the sides of the north, the city of the great king. It's a place. It's a thing. It's a noun for God. In Psalm 51, verse 12, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Even when God interacts with us from his perspective, joy is a feeling that we have. It's a thing. Psalm 105, verse 43 says, And be brought forth, I'm sorry, and he brought forth his people with joy and his chosen with gladness. 
And in Psalm 126, 5, they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. To God, joy is a thing. It is a noun. But to us, joy is a verb. It is an action, much like glory. For God, it is a noun, it is a thing, it is his glory. It is something that he possesses, something that he holds, something that he draws us into. But for us, glory is something we do for him. We glorify God. We glory in him. It's an action for us. Joy is the same way. Psalm 21, verse number 1. The king shall joy in thy strength, O Lord. And in thy salvation, how greatly shall he rejoice. The king shall joy. That's an action. Isaiah chapter 9, verse number 3. They joy before thee according to the joy in harvest, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. It is an action. It is something that we do. Again, drawing in this thought of rejoicing being separate than joy. Joy in and of itself is an action. For us. We looked at it Wednesday, Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 18. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. Romans 5, 11, And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. 2 Corinthians 7, 13, Therefore we were com uh, comforted in our comfort, yea, in exceeding the more joyed, for, uh, joyed we for the joy of Titus, because his spirit was refreshed by you all. Philippians 2, verse 17 and 18. Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. For the same cause also do ye joy and rejoice with me. Joy is an action. It is a verb. It is a thing we can do. And lastly, 1 Thessalonians 3, 9 says, For what thanks can we render to God again for you? For all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before our God. Led me to this thought. The joy of the Lord is where our joy comes from. Thinking about the joy of the Lord, boy, <clears throat> that's something I'd love to get my head wrapped around. About God being joyful. And to take that thought further that his joy would be fulfilled in me. And comparing the way God looks at joy and the way I look at joy, him seeing it as a noun, a thing, a tangible thing. And yet for me, joy needs to be a verb, a thing that I do. It tells me one thing. It's a choice. You say, how do you have joy in the midst of sorrow? Well, you don't. You joy in the midst of sorrow. How do you have joy in the midst of disappointment? Well, you don't. You joy in the midst of disappointment. When things go wrong, when days are bad, how do you have joy? Well, you don't. You joy. You choose it. You act it. Joy is a thing that we can work out, that we can put on. That we can act through. I will joy in the God of my salvation. That's a choice. That's an action. That's a move. <laughs> Say, how do we joy in tribulations? We just praise the Lord. Job did it. Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. The Lord gave. The Lord taketh away. Or as it has been or misquoted, the Lord takes and the Lord gives away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job wasn't happy. Job wasn't joyful. But he joyed. He rejoiced in God. He glorified God. I've always had trouble with this concept. It always seemed like an impossible standard. We need to be joyful, no matter what. Even Jesus wasn't joyful all the time, but he always joyed. Even in the midst of the times where we see him wrestling with his will and God's will, the Father's will. 
And that itself fascinates me. He says, not my will, but thine be done. What is that if not joying in the Lord? And saying, God, it's your way. It's your will. Christian joy in the Lord. Let it be a verb to you. Let it be an action. Let it be a thing that we can choose to do. When that's the case, it doesn't matter what comes our way. It doesn't matter what might be getting in the way. It doesn't matter what might be hindering us or what might be in a position where the world would even say, look, you don't, you don't owe God anything. That, that might be true from your perspective. <laughs> but I will joy in the God of my salvation. The fruit of the Spirit. Walking in the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love. But that doesn't mean we feel love all the time. It means we choose love. And it is joy, but that doesn't mean we feel joyful all the time. It means we choose joy. I will joy. Let it be an action for you. May we put it into practice even this week. God deserves all the praise, all the glory. He deserves all of the credit. May we do our best to do that, to give it to him, to joy in the Lord. The joy of the Lord. It's quite the subject, despite being just found in one verse of Scripture. May we joy this week in him. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. And Lord, I thank you for the promises we have that if we walk in the spirit, Lord, there's no condemnation. And God, if that were all that we got out of our salvation, that we were right with God, what a glory that would be. But God, we have the opportunity on a day-by-day -day basis to joy and rejoice in you. Lord, may our lips be a vessel of your praise and your honor and your glory. Lord, may we choose to joy and the things of the Lord, God, despite our circumstances, and even because of our circumstances. Lord, we thank you for your goodness to us. Pray that we would do all we can this week to walk in the Spirit. Pray you go with us as we leave this place. Go before us into our weeks, into our jobs, into all that we have planned, all that we don't have planned. Lord, that we might draw close to you. You would draw close to us. Bring us back again safely midweek. And please, Lord, be with the prayer requests that have been mentioned, and especially those that have not, the burdens on our hearts. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your many blessings. Look forward to all that you'll do for us this week in Jesus' name. Amen.